Welcome to the Deepak Saini Show. Welcome to the Deepak Saini Show. I'd like to thank J23 for the intro music. You can find a link to her music in the show description. This is a special recording done live at Potapalooza 2023. My guest today is Frank King. Frank, suicide prevention speaker, was a writer for The Tonight Show for 20 years. That's amazing. Uh, speaker and comedian for 37. He's fought a lifetime battle with depression and su suicidality. Yep. Okay. I, I, I've never heard that word it's written that way. Uh, talking about the long, dark journey uh, of the soul. And he's done 11 TEDx talks. Shares his life-saving insights uh, with with uh, various organizations and associations uh he's survived two aortic valve replacements that's something i did not know uh double yep. bypass heart attack and uh losing to a puppet on star search i love the joke <laughs> talking about okay there's so much here to go on uh frank welcome to the deepak sandy show thank you i i figure any podcast could find something in that laundry list of uh <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, we and we uh, we this is a short one here as a special uh, Potapalooza episode. But uh, let's yeah. start with Frank. How did you how did you get into doing what you're doing? Like, how did you even get into comedy and writing for the Tonight Show or where you know wherever you want to take that question? How, how did you get to where yeah. you're at today? We'll start uh, in fourth grade, nine years old, told the joke. Kids laughed. Teacher was so hysterical. She had to excuse herself to go to the teacher's lounge. I decided at that moment, I'm going to be a stand up comedian. Twelfth grade, they had a talent show. Nobody had ever done stand up. I did stand up. I won. And then I told my mother I was moving to L.A. And she said, no, you're going to get a college degree first. I don't care what you do when you get done. You can be a goat herder for all I care. But you're going to be a goat herder with a college degree. So I went to UNC Chapel Hill, got a couple of degrees, and then moved to San Diego. There's a branch of the comedy store there. Did open mic night. My first five minutes on stage inside my head, I heard a little voice. You're home. So 18 months later, I said to my girlfriend, now my wife of 37 years, I'm going on the road. You want to come along for the ride? thinking she'd go, hell no. She said, yeah. So we were on the road for 2,629 nights in a row, nonstop. That's wow. seven years and change, yeah. Well, and the way I got to work for Leno was, Leno was the the single permanent guest host for Johnny Carson. And Johnny would pull up on a Friday afternoon and go, I'm not working next week. Which meant Jay had four nights, 18 jokes a night for the monologue he had to cover and had to write them essentially over the weekend. So he started hiring road comics to write jokes for him. So I'd pump in a dozen, two dozen, three dozen jokes over the weekend. And I was averaging about one or two a week. And then he got the job for real, let most of the contract labor go, kept some of us on. And I rode that horse until he left for CNBC. So it was a, and he's a great guy. When I had my first aortic valve replacement and I got into a regular room after ICU, the first phone call I got was from Leno. Hey, heard you had heart surgery. I should have, good thing you didn't do it in LA. They take it out and leave it out. So that's how I got into comedy. Very cool. Very cool. What is your, uh, every, from best I know, and I'm not in the industry, best I know, there's more bombs than there are hits in comedy. Is what, do you have a memorable experience? Maybe two. One was like, this was the highlight. This is like the pinnacle of my comedy career. And one's like, ugh. That was the worst ever. <laughs> well, 89, you know, in show business, you never know whether you're on your way up or on your way down. Turns out in 89, I peaked. I had two Showtime specials. I had Star Search where I won two episodes and lost to a puppet. And I did Evening at the Improv all in that one year. And I had no idea at the time that was the that was the peak of my comedy career. Um, my, my probably my most memorable appearance, I opened up at an amphitheater in Michigan one summer, two nights for a a country singer named Randy Travis. And there are 5,000 people a night, 10,000 eyeballs. Now, Randy's got a band and backup singers and lyrics and music. I got a microphone. So it was, it was, it was uh, exhilarating. Uh, worst, Kingsport, Tennessee. Um, I'm not saying everybody in Kingsport is a Bible thumping, race baiting, homophobic redneck who thinks the Holocaust is fake and wrestling is real. Just the people who came to my show. So they love the they love the guy who came in front of me, Pat Miller. Very funny. He's like three feet tall, three feet wide, three hundred pounds. He's walking across the platform they built, and a board breaks audibly. Best ad lib I've ever heard. He turns to the audience. He goes, "Don't panic. It's just a stage I'm going through." Uh, <laughs> that's actually good. That's really good. 
Yeah, they loved him, hated me. So about halfway through my act, I look down and I can't see past the front row, but over the shoulder of the guy in the front row is the hand of the guy in the second row holding a nickel-plated 38 revolver with the hammer back pointed at me. So I turned sideways to make a smaller target, lowered my elbow to cover my vital organs, not my first rodeo, and just waited. And about 90 seconds, this is pure East Tennessee, a woman in the back yells out, hey, either shoot him or put it away. Fortunately, he put it away. Uh, that's probably my worst. I mean, I've had bad shows, you know, where it's just crickets. Sure. Um, my first cruise gig, two 45-minute shows. My wife's in the audience. She so quiet. She said she could hear the tongue sticking to the roof of my mouth. She says, like, watching somebody you love get beat up and there's nothing you can do about it. So, I mean, you ask comics, they can give you chapter and verse on the horrible shows. Right. Okay, so let's let's rewind it back back to the buy on something you said earlier. Uh, lost to a Muppet or Puppet. Which, which yep. one? Uh, a guy named JTO and Bobby Duck. Um, he wasn't a particularly good ventriloquist, but the duck was drop dead cute. I okay. would have voted for the duck. I, yeah. I don't I don't know that I one. I'm, I'm gonna have to do a Google search after. I'm not I'm not familiar with that one. Okay, yeah. cool. Well, Google Google um, JTO and Bobby Duck, Frank King and Star Search. You'll see me lose. Okay. Okay, I I I I definitely definitely will. So um, let's let's take a maybe a little bit more of a serious tone here. Uh, lifetime battle of depression and and suicidality. Where, where, where did that where, where did that come from? How did you cope? Uh, same place my heart problems came from. My family, uh, all my all my heart surgeries, nothing lifestyle generated. It was my dad was born. My dad had a bad heart valve. Pass it on to me. My mother had the cholesterol of a deep fat fryer. Pass it on to me. And the mental illness runs in my mother's family. It's called generational depression and suicide. My grandmother died by suicide. My mother found her. My great aunt died by suicide. My mother and I found her. I was four years old. I screamed for days. And I myself, in the last recession, after people stopped booking conferences, business dropped off 80%. We filed Chapter 7 bankruptcy. That's when I learned what the barrel of my gun tasted like. Literally, spoiler alert, I did not pull the trigger. Uh, I do that in my keynote. People laugh kind of nervously, and I follow it with, a friend of mine saw my keynote recently, came up afterwards. Hey, man, how come you didn't pull the trigger? <laughs> I said, hey, man, because you try to sound slightly less disappointed. Uh, that's where the humor is in the topic. So right, right. I'd always want to make a living and a difference. I just had no idea how. And a friend of mine named Judy Carter wrote a book called The Message of You, The Message of You, Turning Your Life into a Money-Making Speaking Career. She sent me a copy, said, Frank, read it, you'll figure it out. I went into it thinking I got nothing. I got about halfway through and I thought, wait a minute, I can speak on suicide prevention. I mean, given my experience and my mental illnesses, and there are more nuts in my family than in a squirrel turd, if I got some <laughs> training, <laughs> thank you, if I got some training in suicide prevention, some certifications, which I have done, I could keynote on it. And, and, and the second hurdle was, I've been a comic for two and a half decades. Who's going to take me seriously? Who's going to believe I can do anything serious? That's when I did my first TEDx to prove to the world. And it was on suicide prevention. And nobody knew in my family, my friends, my wife, that I was living with major depressive disorder and chronic suicidal ideation. So on that stage at TEDx, I came out of the mental health closet and told people I have major depressive disorder and chronic suicidal ideation. Now, don't feel bad about not knowing what suicidality is. I've said I've said chronic suicidality or chronic suicidal ideation to therapists who've been doing it for 20 years, and they stare at me like a pig staring at a wristwatch. They have no idea what I'm talking about. It's not very common. It's not in the DSM, the big you know manual right. of, uh, of illnesses. Um, what it means is for people like me and my tribe, the option of suicide is always on the menu as a solution to problems large and small. And I tell the audience, when I say small, my car broke down a couple of years ago. I had three thoughts unbid. One, get it fixed. Two, buy a new one. Three, I could just kill myself. That's chronic. The upside of telling that story is almost every time I've told it on stage, there's been at least one person in the audience, sometimes more, who have that. They have no idea it has a name. They think they're just some kind of freak and all alone. And a young woman come up after a college show. She said, thanks for the keynote. I said, you're welcome. She goes, but I got to tell you, it made me weep. How did it make you weep? She goes, you know the story about the car? Get it fixed. 
buy a new one, kill yourself. Like, yeah, I've been having those thoughts all my life, she said. I didn't know it had a name. I just thought I was some kind of freak and completely alone. And when I heard you say that you have it, I realized I was not alone and I wept. So there's the ROI. So how? So many people don't know about it, but you're finding a couple people every time you do the talk. So is there any stats on like how many percent of population, how many people in the U.S. or the Western world, whatever, like actually have this condition? No, I've never been able to find any. I know about 20, 25% of people have a mental challenge on average in the population, but sure. I've seen no no numbers on, because again, it's not in the DSM. It's not it's not widely known. I didn't know I had it until I wrote the book. I co-wrote four books on men's mental health with a psychologist and a therapist. And I'd never been, I'd never been to see any anybody, psychologist, therapist, psychiatrist. But in the process of writing the book and chatting with them and telling them my symptoms, they diagnosed me. I'm like, what? It. it has a name? Really? I just thought it was me. Okay, so that brings up a whole nother question. That I was going uh, so. Uh, so how come it's not in the DSM yet? Like, yeah, it's not in the DSM five. I'm hoping maybe we'll make the DSM six. Oh, okay. So that's the goal. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, hopefully it'll become common enough that it will make it into the, uh, because it, you know, if one or two people, I mean, it's not it's a very small subset, but they're, they're, they're living thinking that nobody else has it. Right. So it's just an awareness, an awareness issue yeah. that needs to come out. Yeah. yeah. So, so Frank, I think myself included, I think many of the audience as well would be like, sounds like you're a very highly functioning person with this how did you keep this at bay if you weren't seeing therapists and counselors etc 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 but watch it <laughs> <laughs> okay that's your choice that's your that's your drink of choice okay Budweiser yeah uh, no uh it's there the um there is there is no medication that I'm aware of for chronic suicidal ideation there is for depression obviously and I took a supplement for a long time called Sammy S-A-M dash E it's good on three things. It's good for your joints, good for your liver, and good on mild depression. At 60, I finally said to my doctor, at my wife's insistence, I needed antidepressant. And he gave me one, small dose, and it happened to work right away. Uh, my wife noticed in two weeks a change in my attitude mood. I didn't notice till three weeks. And I didn't notice until I had this thought. I like my life. Came out of nowhere. I mean, I've got a good life. I speak for a living, lovely wife, you know. Uh, a good life, but I hadn't had that thought. I liked my life since I was 18. And my second thought was, why did I wait so long to take this little pill? Now, for your audience, about a third of psychotropics work really well for whoever's taken. Another third works okay. And the last third, horrible. And the problem is, if it doesn't work, then you have to go back and taper off and try something else. I would... I would do a DNA cheek swab test. They have these now where right. they take your DNA and they try to match it to the couple of medications that would work best with your particular metabolism. So you narrow down the list and, and, and it's a lot less like being like a lab rat. You know, go on, could work, taper off. Go on, didn't work, taper off. But it happened to work for me. So, and I have a self-care plan. Which I, that's, my, that's my action item at the end of my keynote. I think everybody should have a self-care plan. Yeah, I love that. I mean, that that's what I'm all about. I just want to really underline what you said there for the audience. I'm 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 big on, you know, from from a, coming from a different aspect, but like on quantification, knowing you know your genetics, DNA, whatever the case mm. may be. You know, I think that's a big thing where, you know, people will go for whatever you know mental health or otherwise to their doctor, and it's like, okay, let's try this, or I think it's this. It's like, well, let's not guess. Let's quantify, and we don't have yeah. tests for everything. But I, I love that you said that, like you know, get the test and say, okay, okay, you know, this type of drug will not serve you. It's going to be this one instead of wasting months or years, even potentially uh, with the wrong medication for you. It's like, no, like this is simple. It's these, co the cost of these things are coming down all the time. So I'm glad you, I'm glad you shared that. Um, and, and, you, yeah. and you brought up self-care plan, which is, uh, you know, so I'd, I'd love to know like, what is, Again, this 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 podcast is not about health, even though that's what I'm all about and what I work on with my clients. But like, uh, and we've had a one conversation uh, some time ago previously. But like, what does your self care plan look like? Well, this is what I do. When you speak, you should have learning objectives, teach them something, and then give them the next natural, next logical step. And I say everybody should have a self care plan. 
Mine is diet. I'm on the keto diet. I do intermittent fasting. Uh, and I, and when I do, when I'm doing bodybuilding contests, I eat a lot less. I eat every other day for a while. Then every third day to get down to, you get my body fat down. Uh, and a keto diet and intermittent fasting, uh, diet exercise. I try to exercise every day. That's a non-negotiable. I think everybody should have in their self-care plan, one non-negotiable, non-negotiable, something you do every day regardless. Could be journaling, could be exercise. So diet exercise, good night's sleep. People discount the, yeah, I, what scares me when somebody says, I can get by on three hours sleep a night. Yeah, not forever. <laughs> but, uh, I, yeah, I would suggest I not like, even for one day. I think you're impaired even after one day, but anyway. Yeah, I'd much rather say somebody said to me, man, I, I, I nailed eight hours last night. And I know my circadian rhythms. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. But diet, exercise, good night's sleep, medication, a little bit of, and it worked for me. And meditation. I, I do a, a meditation twice a day after a meal. It's called the cat nap, where it's an MP3. It, it takes you down and then brings you back up the other side. It's like a right. like like the old computer. Pull it out, plug it on the wall, plug it back in. Yeah. Um now the my circadian rhythm, I believe you should be on a schedule. I believe you should go to bed about the same time, get up same time, binge watch Netflix same time, work out same time. And I've discovered that my I set an alarm for one in the morning, believe it or not. I get up, I do a couple of shots of espresso. I lie back down and I just let my mind wander. And oftentimes very creative, you know, in a half sleep, half awake state right, right. in the dark. And then I get up at two and I'm on my way. And that's, and I go, I try to get in bed by seven. Just Cause I need six hours, six and a half. That's my, that's my minimum. It works really well. I mean, oftentimes at six and a half, my eyes pop open. Good sign. Before the alarm goes off. So I believe a schedule is important. And I do something called gamification. If you have trouble getting out of bed, I occasionally have trouble getting out of bed mentally. I'll make a to-do list. An actual physical, take your pen and pencil, pen or pencil, and make a to-do list. Six things. And the game is, once I scratch off number six, I can go back to bed. I don't care if it's three in the afternoon, broad daylight, and do what I've been wanting to do which is binge watch the next whatever Netflix show I happen to be watching. So I win. So you give yourself a way to win. The gym is 25 minutes away. The game is if I go to the gym and I go inside, if I don't, if I'm not feeling it, I can do one rep of one exercise, turn around and go home. I've never done that. I'm always, I'm always there using 90 minutes, but that's the deal. If I pulled in and I just, just, I had to go in do a curl. All right. And then leave. Uh, I, I love what you said about your circadian rhythm, and I, I was actually just bringing this up earlier uh, today here at Potapalooza, uh, and, I, and I've done extensive uh, testing uh, with I mean, my aura ring and, and, and other devices. My sweet spot is uh, six hours, 45 minutes to seven hours and 15 minutes. That's my, that's my, you know, a little bit too less than that. I'm not at my peak too much. I'm not at my peak either. So I love that you have it dialed in uh, as well. Uh, I know. I'm curious. I know the audience is going to be curious as to what is your current uh, show that you're binge watching on Netflix right now? Uh, let's see. Um, Netflix. I just saw the one called uh, Hunter Killer, which is a movie about a submarine under the uh, ice in the uh, Arctic, I believe. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah. And uh, I Prime, I was watching. I love the Bosch series on Prime. I just watched the two seasons, two newest seasons of Bosch, Harry Bosch, the um former detective, now private eye, um, Bass Reeves on, I think it's on Paramount. It's a black sheriff back in the old West. And it was based on a true story. And, oh, Slow Horses I on don't know Apple. Yes, um, Gary Oldman stars. Amazing. Oh. They're in their fourth season. This Slow Horses, it's um, disgraced MI5 agents. They rather than fire them, they ship them to this. They call it the slow house, S L O U G H, uh, and they ship them there. It's like it's like, um, you know, sort of not not firing them, but isolating them all the losers together. Right. Um. And and you know they've done something wrong, but they're all pretty good at what they do. So and Gary Oldman's amazing. I just oh. watched the the the, uh, the the episode this morning. I'm, I'm like, look at it. It posted. It posted. It posted. It posted. And I love Very Star cool. Wars, you know, the uh, yeah. series. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, you know, I'll just, uh -huh. I'll just ask Alexa. this. Oh, there we go. Um, do you watch comedy shows since your background in comedy as well? Do you like no. that? New... No. 
I mean, I sitcoms occasionally. Uh, the original Frasier, the new one is just, I tried, I couldn't. Um, the comedians, however, uh, Bill Burr is my current favorite U.S. comedian. Okay, yep. And Jimmy Carr is my favorite one from uh, Great Britain. He is he is amazingly dirty and sick, but incredibly well written. I mean, it just, and he's got this baby face and this strange laugh and it just, he, he he makes it work, and I just I'm you know. I'm sure you coming from that background, you have an appreciation, especially for the writing uh, of of comedy and how the the lead up to the punchline. I'm sure you have a different appreciation than the layperson like myself would have. Yes, um, the it, his stuff is political, but really well written. Right, um, political, uh, often off color. <laughs> but yeah, I love the writing. I think the best Con- comedians are usually so. And Seinfeld, I worked Seinfeld a couple of times uh, in clubs. And, you know, he said, the job really is writing. The delivery yeah. part is just fun. The writing part is the hard part. Sure. Absolutely. I've, I've getting the gig. Yeah. <laughs> getting the yeah. gig. You know, getting the gig is easier than writing good comp. So, Frank, as we're wrapping up here uh, in this special edition for Potapalooza, um, you have a gift for the audience. Uh, why don't you tell the audience what, uh, and again, we'll have all of uh, Frank's uh, links and how you can get a hold of them and, and the link for this gift uh, in the show notes. But, uh, Frank, what, what, what's this uh, gift you'd like to share with the audience? Well, as I mentioned, two co-authors now, two women, a psychologist and therapist, wrote a series of four books on men's mental health. They're actually anthologies. Each book has 12 guys. Each one has a different issue. Could be mental health, could be alcoholism or substance abuse or divorce, physical injury. Um, and the the point of it is, is first 500 words is life is good. Second 500 words, here's how it went bad. Third 500 words, here's how I'm coping. We're hoping that men will pick it up, see their condition, and see how another guy is coping because guys take advice from guys. And so... Um, the four books are all on Amazon. Guts, Grit, and the Grind, a mental mechanics manual. And the first one is available in audiobook on Amazon. However, I had my audio editor create an MP3 for me. So I'll give you a link you can put in the show notes, and they can download the audiobook unabridged of book one, and I narrate it. Oh, that was awesome. part of my deal with the ladies was I'll do it. I'll make it funny if I can be a co-author and narrate it. So I voiced the book. Very cool. Very cool. So yeah, everyone definitely check that out. And again, if you or you you know someone, and we all probably know somebody who's struggling with something. And again, Frank's right. Men have a hard time talking and they're probably going to listen not to their wives or their doctor. They're going to listen to other dudes. So yeah, definitely if you know somebody yourself or somebody you, you know is struggling with one of these things or something, uh, get get this uh, get this download uh, for you. Uh, Frank, I, I really appreciate you taking the time. This is a hilarious uh, conversation. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you for being on the Deepak Sandy Show. Well, can I close it out like a comedian would? Uh, okay, you know what? I'll give you the last word. Let me just do my closing here. Uh, after yeah. Frank's last word, we're going to throw it to J23, who's going to uh, guide us out with some music. And I just want to thank everyone for listening to the Deepak Sandy Show. Exceptional results for the exceptional you. Frank, take it away. Yes, if you enjoyed the podcast, please rate, subscribe, and review and tell your friends. If you did not enjoy this podcast, well, we hope you have no friends. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it any better than that. Thank you, Frank. Everyone, Till next time. This episode is brought to you by Bioptimizers and their Herbal Parasite Guardian product. Now, I don't take this too often, but if I'm going to Mexico or some other, you know, Caribbean nation or someplace like that where, you know, the foods may be a little iffy, I will take this along with me and pop a couple of these uh, after I have maybe a questionable meal, maybe a, from a food cart or uh, something like that. So again, it's just something nice to have in the arsenal. So again, you can check out the link here uh, and get 10% off this product or many of the other products uh, that Bioptimizers has. I love their magnesium. I love their uh, digestive enzymes and so on. So check it out. The link here for 10% off or more. Cheers. Podcast produced by the Minted Green Company 